Julia Ward Howe, uh, she was not born in Boston. Uh, she was born in lower Manhattan. Her father was a very successful banker. She came from a very privileged home. He himself, and this is something that, that does not come out in her standard biographies, her parents were very devout evangelical Episcopalians. Uh, he, I have read family letters. Uh, her father was extremely devout man, leading family worship, uh, attended a church, uh, was a member of a church in Manhattan that uh, was a leading church in the evangelical movement within Episcopalianism in the 1820s, 1830s. Her mother was very devout. Her mother's brother was a very prominent Episcopal minister in Brooklyn for decades. And Julia Ward Howe turned away from all of that. Uh, she was baptized into the church. She was confirmed. She took First Communion in the Episcopal Church, and she turned her back on all of it. And I don't know the whole story yet about that. But certainly by the time she married uh, Samuel Gridley Howe, a very prominent reformer and philanthropist, by the time she married him and moved to Boston, she plunged into radical liberal Unitarianism. She was part of a, a, uh, uh, the avant-garde theologically in America. And uh, we can come back to who her two pastors were in Boston. I think people will find, especially if they know anything about uh, antebellum religious history in America, they'll be astonished at, at who her big influences were. But she was educated uh, as a child uh, at home uh, through tutors who even lived in the home sometimes. She was uh, fluent in French, in German. She knew Italian. She knew uh, Latin, Greek. As an adult, she hired a rabbi in Rome to teach her Hebrew. Uh, she was an astonishing uh, intellect. And she was publishing review essays when she was maybe 16, 17 years old and doing the translations from French and German herself uh, in these translations. And I believe it's there that she was first introduced to a lot of German philosophy and theology, uh, a lot of uh, German literature for sure. She was a great admirer of Goethe, Schiller, but she was reading uh, Kant, uh, she could never get a, a hold of Hegel, <laughs> which is the experience of a lot of people. Yeah, I was going to say, who can? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. She uh, she decided at one point that he was intentionally unintelligible, uh, but but her great favorite was Kant, and she continued to lecture into the 1880s uh, about uh, Kant's influence on America. She was taken very seriously by American philosophers, university uh, presidents. She spoke at the Concord School of Philosophy uh, in the 1880s about uh, German idealism. So she was saturated, absolutely saturated with German philosophical idealism and the theology that went along with it. So should we yeah. take her to Boston now and uh, yeah, well, talk about I, her I'd love to hear there? about that because you know that I would like to read the full biography when you when it when it's available at some point in terms of her religious kind of transition, but understanding right. her ecclesiastical context and and some of the the views and events surrounding the pastors in Boston is is also significant. It, it, it is, and on a number of levels, because it's just assumed that she was a mainstream American Christian. Uh, people don't pay any attention to what she spent most of her time thinking about and writing about. Yeah. She once pointed to her library, to her granddaughter, and she said, this is what I want to be remembered for. And she's only remembered for one poem. And that has eclipsed almost everything else about her. Uh, so when she went to Boston, and I know you'll know these names, uh, Camden and Jeff, uh, <laughs> she first attended uh, Theodore Parker's church in Boston, uh, the uh, one of the most radical of the liberal Unitarians. Uh, he was in the same circles as Emerson and others in that Harvard Divinity School circle. 
And uh, he was really, uh, really pushing hard uh, to uh, to promote uh, the higher criticism and uh, a, a kind of radical Unitarianism in which Christ almost it almost vanishes uh, the the uniqueness of Christ, the 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 identity of Christ. He gets to the point where he's saying, you know, we we await another Christ who will be the truest and highest manifestation of the God Spirit. All this kind of stuff, wow. and that's her pastor and very close family friend. They vacation together. After a while, they leave that church for some murky reasons. And they go off to uh, James Freeman Clark. Now his his name is not as familiar anymore, but mm. he was as almost as prominent as Theodore Parker, and she was part of his congregation for the rest of his life into the 1880s. So probably from the 1840s to the 1880s, and then she stayed in that church when the, when the next uh, uh, pastor arrived there. And by the way, her dates are 1819 to 1910. Mm. She lived a very long, productive life, and she kept diaries for decades, which uh, very few historians have made any use of. 